Thank you guys very much. Great to be here. Um, it's been a, uh, an exciting week already. Uh, in fact, I haven't had a week quite as exciting uh, in several years. <laughs> Thank God. Um, that's not to say that I'm always long, but when the market uh, throws as much crap at us as it's thrown, uh, especially coming on the heels of a really crazy January, basically, for anybody who's traded crypto. And I trade both, uh, cryptos and stocks. That's why when Kim asked me uh, if I'd come and speak to you guys, I thought, ah, this would be a pretty good one to talk about, uh, stocks versus cryptos and so forth. Uh, because there, I have said to many people that I think it's the biggest opportunity of our lifetimes. Um, cryptocurrencies. I think it's certainly the biggest that I've seen since listed options came in Chicago in 1972-ish, 1973. Before then, they were just over the counter. They were just, you know, you'd pick up the phone, call somebody and buy or sell an option. And back then, they didn't even have puts. They only had calls. And then they came up with listed put options by the time I got to Chicago, uh, which was 1981. I played uh, four games for the Chicago Bears. Um, then they figured out that Mike Singletary was better than me. Um, and uh, then I went down to the trading floor. And fabulous time to be in that market. As I say, there were only maybe, um, and I guess I can walk around anywhere. I don't need to speak into the microphone because I'm mic'd up. Um, you'd think I'd remember things like that. Uh, but. Luckily, I've been trading now for 37 years on the floors uh, of the Pacific, the Chicago Board Option Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, the CME Group. Um, I've been a member of the New York Stock Exchange and the Amex and the PhilEx. So I've pretty much traded almost anywhere you can trade on a trading floor uh, in the United States. Um, my brother and I were lucky enough to come up with the idea um, for... Uh, our friend Dylan Radigan had a show on television called uh, Bullseye. It was on CNBC. And we'd come on to that show, but I was a regular on Fox at the time, so I could only do it sparingly because they don't like to share. Um, and we more or less had the idea that if you put together something um, which would be a combination of ESPN Sports Center um, and the after game wrap up with, for instance, a coach and players and or other coaches on a desk, and we did a wrap up like that, that that would be something people would you know, really like to hear rather than just journalists talking about what the market did that day. And ultimately CNBC put their magic on it, turned it into, half to, uh, turned it into the Fast Money Show. Um, I was not able to go there. My wife is a, a judge in Chicago. Instead of going and moving to New York, I told them, I can't do it. I can only be a guest. Uh, and they said, well, you know, lots of people want to do this, John. Are you sure? And I said, I'm sure lots of people want to do it. But back then, they were saying, but you can't trade. And I said, if I can't trade, I can't make money because you're not paying me enough money to give up trading. And they said, we'll find plenty. They didn't. So they came back and asked again. And... Uh, uh, because most people uh, in our business worked for and still do work for firms like Goldman Sachs or Virtu or J.P. Morgan or whomever. Um, and generally, they won't let you speak for that firm. Um, so there's no way they're going to let you, a 22-year-old loose on a network television show talking about finance, uh, because they worry about what the message might be and how it might be perceived. So... The only people who could were independent traders like my brother and I. So Pete moved out to New York, has been on Fast Money ever since. Um, he doesn't live there anymore. Now he commutes in from Minneapolis, and I commute in from Chicago. So with that as a little bit of a backdrop, I'm going to get into my presentation, uh, Stocks versus Cryptos. It was really cool. I got to meet Charlie Schrem outside. I don't know if you guys have met him. Some of you who are active in cryptos know who he is but he is one of the guys uh, in Bitcoin um, that was really there uh, virtually from the start. Um, so he's not Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever that or they are, um, but 
he's pretty cool, uh, and it was really neat to meet him. Um, and I hope to uh, get him onto our shows uh, on CNBC soon. I thought this was pretty key, too, because this is Christine Lagarde. You guys don't see her picture as often as we do on CNBC, but she's saying not long ago, experts argued that personal computers would never be adopted and that tablets would only be used as expensive coffee trays. So I think it may not be wise to dismiss virtual currencies. Couldn't agree more. Um, in fact, I'm going to show you some slides about things that I really do disagree with from really smart people like Nouriel Rabini or Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner. Um, I don't have a Nobel Prize on my mantle, but I think Paul Krugman is absolutely wrong about many of his, the things that he looked at as far as cryptocurrencies and what it really is. Because, like I say, incredible opportunity right now for you guys. And most of the people like me that are hiring people, I have right now three young guys that trade for me. Um, be happy, by the way, ladies, to have three young ladies trading for us too. It just happened to meet these. I met these guys in high school and they were gamers and they had a huge gaming setup in their basement. When I say huge, I mean 15 PCs, uh, maybe 20 monitors and they're pro gaming. They're playing for money online. Um, and then all of a sudden they started picking up on cryptocurrencies and started trading them and making an obscene amount of money and so I threw some money at them um, and said, trade this. And now they're just doing another raise um, where they're, they've just raised a lot more money. And they're all three 20 years old in college and trading for us. Um, but they're so good. I, one of them has quit college now. I didn't encourage him to do that, but he did. Um, and his dad was a trader, so his dad kind of knows um, you know, what it's like when all of a sudden you, a light goes off and you say, I think I can really do this. Um, but cryptocurrency trading is completely different from stock trading, and that's why most stock traders can't do it. Um, and that's why a lot of you guys, without the preconceived notions of what works and doesn't work, are probably going to be better at it than many of the other folks. Um, I show you this one because when I compare cryptocurrencies to the stock market, couldn't have a better week to be doing it because obviously the stock market has had insane movements this week. Last Friday, we were down 666 points. Monday, we were down. Tuesday, we fell 1,600 points and rallied back to finish down 1,000. Um, and the very next day, we were up 568 points. I mean, craziness in the market. That's good for guys like me. Um, I love trading crazy markets. It's my favorite time to trade. Um, there is the most opportunity on those times, which again, feeds back into this loop about me telling you the greatest opportunity of our lifetime because that's how cryptos trade. This, market volatility, so October 19th, 1987, long before your moms and dads even met, uh, let alone that you guys were <laughs> born, uh, the Dow Jones fell 508 points almost 23% in one day. Uh, this week, as I said, we finished down 1,000, over 1,000 points on Tuesday, um, and we had an ugly day again, you know, two days later, but we didn't move anywhere near 23%. Uh, we moved on that day 3.4%. Uh, um, quite certain why it cuts in and out a little bit, but I'll move away from the podium a little bit. Um, but anyway, uh, that kind of market volatility is crazy, creates great opportunities. People that didn't panic on that day made fortunes over the next decade. Um, so I bring that up and I compare it to, for instance, things like that. That was when I was live on air and the market was in the midst Tuesday of falling from down 700 to down 1600 in four and a half minutes and then came all not all the way back, all the way back down 700. Um, and then bled off into the close again. So the largest interday point drop for the Dow in history. It was an extremely ugly day. I don't know if, uh, if my next slide shows that, no. Um, I had an animation slide, but it wasn't working correctly, so I think I tossed it. But basically, when you look at things like 
Bitcoin and uh, Litecoin, um, uh, Ethereum, Ripple, uh, Vertcoin, uh, Einsteinium. I mean, I must trade 30 different cryptocurrencies. Um, and for the most part, the only ones I buy are the ones that are like seven or eight cents. And I buy them looking for the unusual activity that means they're about to hockey stick to the upside. Um, hockey stick, of course, is a flat thing like this, and then it's got the, the uh, blade, if you will, of the stick that goes up like that. That's what all traders are looking for, is to catch that as it's starting to hockey stick. Um, so the rest of them I just trade. Um, I've owned Bitcoins um, for years. Um, started buying it when it was 300, like an idiot, got out of them when they were 800. Um, if I have held them, I wouldn't even be here now. Um, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd own an island somewhere. Um, but uh, they are uh, still an incredible opportunity. There are, uh, I think earlier this year, we hit 900 billion in market cap. That's taking all the cryptocurrencies. You guys might already know this, but if you go to coinmarketcap.com, you can see virtually um, the, the market capitalization of all of the cryptos that are out there um, together on one page. You can see how much volume's traded. I'll show you some slides of it, but how much volume's traded at that particular currency so far in the last 24 hours. And as you guys know, they do run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There is no off time which is partially why our guys can trade them while they're off in college, because you know, it really doesn't matter. Uh, sometimes, somewhere around the world, people are trading them 24 hours a day. Doesn't matter if it's Korea, Japan, Russia, Europe. I'm, I just came back from um, a uh, sick tour through, I went to, uh, let's see, flew into Zurich, then I hit Vienna, then I hit Innsbruck, then I hit Val Gardena, then back to Zurich, then back to Lugano and Zug, then down to um, Milan, then Monaco. And on last Thursday, I flew, I drove from Monaco to Milan, flew from Milan to throw to Chicago, Chicago to Minneapolis for the Super Bowl. So the great thing, I'll tell you one thing though, if you do get addicted to these cryptos and you actually get really involved, not just trading, but got involved with them, these people don't have homes. Um, they spend their lives on the road. It's crazy, which has created a bunch of offshoot industries that you can have some pretty good fun with. Anyway, gold versus the S&P 500 versus Bitcoin. So world's total gold supply, about two and a half million tons. Um, that's about 103 trillion market cap, 103 trillion. Keep in mind, I told you all cryptos put together almost hit a trillion this year and then pulled back dramatically. Now they're about 500 billion, I think, half a trillion. I still think they'll be over 2 trillion by year end, uh, total cryptos. And Bitcoin won't be the granddaddy for that much longer. It might still be the highest priced one, but I don't think it'll be the one that everybody uh, goes for going forward. Um, here's another look at the world's uh, money. If you want to say, okay, 80, 83 trillion are in currencies of any sort. And then as you can see, moving up the chart, passing Apple, Amazon, um, Bill Gates, Larry Page, and so forth. You might recall also that briefly, one of the guys that founded Ripple um, was the richest man in the world, briefly. And then it went away pretty quick, almost as fast as he became the richest man. Um, this was the article that I was speaking of earlier uh, uh, that Paul Krugman wrote. I believe he wrote this last Wednesday. Tuesday or Wednesday was in the New York Times last week. And he says, bubble, bubble, fraud, and trouble. And one thing about Bitcoin or anything that's on the blockchain is there's almost no potential for fraud um, because everything's verified by all or if you want to call them miners, the people that are actually verifying all these things and fighting each other for, to see who's got the fastest computer to verify that this transaction from John so that my Bitcoin can't be spent twice, so that it can only, when I buy something with a cryptocurrency, whichever crypto it might be, those maintainers are all out there. And again, they like to refer to them as miners. They're out there 
fighting for who uh, basically put that that last, hmm, I'm going to drop this down a little bit, maybe that'll look better. Um, but anyway, they're working on who can put that block together the fastest, and then everybody on the network has to verify that that is indeed what happened, to make sure that that coin doesn't get spent twice, or that that fraction of a coin, because of course, you don't have to trade a complete coin. Anyway, so I, I didn't really get that part that Mr. Krugman was talking about, um, but here, and I'm going to read a little bit of it, so I need to walk to the side. He says, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value at all. Combine that with the lack of tether to reality, with the limited extent to which Bitcoin is used for anything, and you have an asset whose price is purely speculative and hence incredibly volatile. Bitcoin lost about 40% of their value over the past six weeks, and blah, blah, blah. If I cherry pick any asset, whether it was Apple the first time it traded 700 and then made a significant correction from there, 30%. Um, or if I take the stock market, I'm, I'm not saying that's what the market's worth. It's worth that at that moment. So he's more or less cherry picking Bitcoin when it's getting crushed last week. He's cherry picking it and said, well, it's not a currency because it lost 40% of its value. I'd throw up a chart for Mr. Krugman of the Swiss franc which is a safety trade, many people refer to it as. They're not part of the European Union. They're an independent country with an independent currency like ours. Um, and the Japanese yen and Swiss franc are two of the safety trades that when people say, oh my God, the world's melting, they run into those trades. In other words, currencies generally pop up because people are fly flooding them with money, whether they're buying in FX markets are actually converting real dollars into Swiss francs or Japanese yen. You can see it happens all the time. But the Swiss franc three years ago, or four years ago now, I guess, fell 30% in one day. That's the Swiss franc, the most stable uh, uh, currency on the planet, the one that, like I say, is the safety trade. And it fell 30% in a day, not in six weeks, in a day and then recovered to only being down 21%. I know I was in Switzerland, and uh, it was, uh, luckily I already booked my hotels and paid for them, otherwise I would have paid 25% or more, uh, more for the exact same room, just the next day. Um, so when you're saying to me, it's not a currency because it moves 40% over six weeks, I'd say to Mr. Krugman, you ever seen the Swiss franc? So that's not a currency either, right, Mr. Nobel Prize winner? Um, let's take a look at some others. This one I thought was funny. Um, this is another guy um, who might be a dinosaur. Um, <laughs> Nuriel Rabini retweeted this, and he's one of the other guys who said, this is going to zero, folks. This is all going to end in tears. They're all going to zero. There's no value. And then so he took a chart of... Uh, a particular cryptocurrency, in this case, Bitcoin. And he said, look, if you look at this, it looks an awful lot like, uh, let's see, I don't know if there's one of these, there we go, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, he said, this looks like the tail of a stegosaurus, sort of, and here's these two sharp things on its back. So then he drew the rest of the body and so forth. And I said, you're brilliant. You know, you should be a Nobel Prize winner too. That's what you're gonna throw at me? when people say that this is the reason it's gonna to go to zero because I can make a graph that looks like, have you, anybody here ever heard of Hindenburg Omen? This is a stock market, a technical term uh, that they claim that it, when this thing happens at the same time that this thing happens, it's the Hindenburg Omen, it always ends in tears. You know, a bunch of people are gonna die, the markets are gonna you know, fall apart and blah, blah, blah. It's never happened but they call it that because one time it happened and somebody drew some stupid picture of a dirigible probably when they did it. Um, so Bitcoin seeking support around 7,700. I don't know if you guys have seen it today. I still, this morning earlier, it was 8,200. Um, that happens to be one of those key areas of support. When you guys hear moving averages, can I see a show of hands? Do most of you know what a moving average is? Not that, not, I'm just wondering if you did. 
basically what you're doing is you're saying, I'm gonna take what the stock price was, for instance, because mostly we're referring to stocks, or in this case, crypto. What is it today, yesterday, last week? You know, take it as many days back as you want. 10-day moving average, 20, 50, 100. A lot of us use 200 or 256. Why 256? Even though it's crypto. Because 256 is approximately the number of trading days in a year for stocks. That's why we use 256. If you take the square root of 256, it's 16. So when we talk about volatility and we say, oh, a volatility of 16, that's a 1% move in the market. A volatility of 32 is a 2% move. In other words, multiples of 16 um, tell you about how much is priced into the market as far as movement up or down. It doesn't tell you direction, just tells you movement up or down. So anyway, when you're looking at Bitcoin, rather than cherry picking and saying, well, when the CME listed their future, on Bitcoin, uh, it was $19,800. So it's made a 40% correction, as he said last week. It's like, like I say, like picking any given stock that traded to any given level and saying that's the value of it. That was only the value of it at that moment. Has it corrected 40% from there? Yes, to me that makes it more interesting. But the real value, if you will, is you take a smoothed you know, take out that high, take out those lows, you smooth it with a 200-day moving average or whatever average you guys want to use, and that's what gives you more or less where, the, where most of the buying and selling is going to come in. And it held. It did trade through this for about 24 hours, smashed through 6,000, in fact, this week, and came right back up within 24 hours, and now it's fighting with this as support which, as you've heard, you've got support and then you've got resistance. This is more or less an area where we're looking for support um, in Bitcoin. In other words, trying to do that. They're trying to turn it from that, take that graph and lift it up like that. Um, this is uh, that dotted line you see there, right here, or the line with the dots. That is approximately that moving average I'm talking about. So, you know, I, th I think many of you know this, but Bitcoin was $1,000 January of 2017 before it traded to $20,000. So 20x your money. Again, biggest opportunity of our life. Um, my wife, for a present, I gave her Bitcoins this year, uh, this past year. And she was like, well, how much is this going to be worth? And... Two months later, she looked at it and she said, it's $20,000. And I said, yep. <laughs> That'll get you excited. And it, it uh, got me out of the doghouse, too. Um, <laughs> initial coin offerings. The reason I want to bring up ICOs, how many have heard of ICOs? Great. This is a very informed crowd compared to most. And again, I'm not surprised because, again, you guys, younger people get this and it's an area that you guys can excel in, I believe. But initial coin offerings, I go overseas and do these all the time now. I've been overseas four times in the last four months. Um, I'll be going back uh, the 20th of uh, February, back to Milan, and then down to Dubai to do initial coin offerings. I'll be representing like seven or eight firms that are doing um, initial coin offerings just like an IPO, it's an ICO. You may have heard that the um, SEC and other regulators, CFTC and so forth, are looking at whether or not they should regulate these as securities. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. That's why I'm doing them overseas. Because um, I don't want to mess with US customers, because if I do, then they could pull me in and say, even though I'm not doing that one, I'm helping these guys do it, they might say, well, that's a securities offering. They should have been a super qualified investor. They needed to have this 99 pages of crap that a lawyer is going to charge them $100,000 for, and you need to only offer it to this many people, and they have to sign off, and blah, 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 blah. Um, nonetheless, the average one raises about $12.7 million. They're doing 50 of these a month overseas right now, 50, 5 every month. Why do people buy them? Mm, generally, uh, I, and I've heard everything from healthcare blockchain stuff that people are doing to, we had a lady from Russia, you might laugh, but 
she had something called cryogen, and she's a cryonics expert. And I said, cryonics, is that like uh, freezing people? She said, yeah. We've got 24 people frozen in Russia right now, and uh, we're raising money with our ICO so that we can, you know, uh, freeze thousands of people so we can bring them back in 100 years when we have cures for all these diseases and so forth. Honest to God, people threw millions at it. Um, I was shocked. Uh, but I'm not, their, I'm not holding their hand as their money manager. I'm just helping bring them to an audience that wants to buy. And there are a lot of those audiences overseas right now. Normally, you're buying at about a 30 to 40% discount. So in other words, if that coin's going to come public at 20 cents, let's say, um, I mean, if you issued a billion coins at 20 cents, you raised $100 million, right? Um, I mean, think of that, a billion coins, and yet they do that. But they'll give you like a 40% discount on a lot of these ICOs. It's pretty common to see at least 30% during the pre-sale, they call it, or the private sale. And then they push them out there and that thing, so in other words, what's 40% of 20? Um, it's eight cents off, so in other words, you're paying 12 cents for something that when it comes public, when it starts trading on um, Bitfinex or Bitstamp or GDAX or wherever you're using to trade these things, um, you can basically take that and you can flip out a big chunk of it right away and recover a lot of money, and now you're still in it and playing with the house's money. That's why a lot of people jump in on these ICOs. Do I have how many minutes begun? Two, okay, so I'll go through the rest of these pretty quick, guys. Um, so here's the money raised by ICOs. Again, in uh, 2017, the most recent data I have. Here you see June, 600, and, uh, I'm sorry, 64 billion. I'm sorry, no, that's 648 billion. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, these are in millions. I thought that was a B at first. My eyes are really bad. Um, but 648 million, 660 million. 1.2 billion in December, and I was there for about that much of it, for almost half of that. Um, profits invested from $1,000 in every featured ICO uh, versus either Ether or Bitcoin. So as you can see, as crazy as Bitcoin was last year, you know, going to 19,900 virtually. Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's Ethereum, here's Bitcoin. 18,700, so $1,000 turned into 18,000, turned into 19,000, $1,000 in all those ICOs, 51,000. And half of them will be bust in six months. But, you know, it, it's buyer beware and it's trading. I mean, you gotta take your profits when you have them. Um, average returns of ICOs outpace Bitcoin, I won't belabor that. Um, over uh, 2 billion in estimated AUM from 100 crypto dedicated funds. So there were, um, at the end of the year last year, in the neighborhood of 100, 120 funds trading crypto. My lawyer in New York right now is doing one a week, has been doing one a week since December. Um, there might be as many as 500 crypto funds within the first 90 or um, 180 days of this year. And what do you think that's gonna do to crypto and to trading? I think it's gonna spike it. Um, let's see, dum, dum, dum. is that my last, nope. So as it turns out, SPX vol was, was, past tense, about an eighth of Bitcoin. But when you look, and here's, uh, that's the S&P, and here's volatility and so forth. Um, the VIX moved this week, 246 was my reading from two days ago, by the way. So that would be a VIX right like this. This is where Bitcoin was in 2011. Look at where Bitcoin vol is now. Bitcoin vol as of uh, the time I printed this slide was right around eight, let's call it seven or eight. Um, that's not the vol, that's the percentage move. You multiply that times 16. But here is where the market is right now with volatility, the stock market, when it's making these 1,600 point moves, 1,000 point moves and so forth. So again, uh, opportunity like crazy. And, whoops, uh, there's a bunch of exchanges. Um, what does our stuff do? Our stuff, we call it heat seeker. Um, that's what I talk about on CNBC all the time. 
It's really an algorithm that's looking for block trades. I don't say every trade's equal. People are equal, trades aren't. So when I see a trade and somebody's putting a ton of money on one trade, that's the one I want to follow, not the little trade. I don't care about 50 little trades. I care about one big trade that's the same size as those 50 little trades. So that's what we follow. And this is an example uh, from this week. Here's 10 trades in a row. This is in the listed securities markets, but this is the Spider, the S&P 500 ETF, 500,000 bang, 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 10 of them in a row. Um, so 5 million shares of the Spider. It's $1.3 billion or something like that. And it happened all like in, in a heartbeat. Those are the guys I want to follow. They were, by the way, all selling. Um, and it fell from um, 275 to 269 in about a minute and a half when those trades hit. So that's why I follow the big trades, because I think they're right. And I want to surf on that wave when it starts to happen. So anyway, with that said, Jordan, thank you very much for having me, guys.